what condition is the American Academy of Pediatrics now suggesting the remedy of drugs and surgery for? What, what condition, Ooh. what childhood conditions, the American Academy of Pediatrics? Uh, I'm going to read, this is not from the uh, AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, although I'll, I'll link to that. But CBS, among everyone else, reported on this. So I'm going to just read the first three paragraphs, alighting the condition itself. Okay. okay. Children struggling with this condition should be evaluated and treated early and aggressively, including with medications for kids as young as 12 and surgery for those as young as 13, according to new guidelines released Monday. The longstanding practice of watchful waiting or delaying treatment to see whether children and teens outgrow or overcome the condition on their own only worsens the problem that affects more than 14.4 million young people in the U.S., researchers say. Left untreated, the condition can lead to lifelong health problems, including high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression. Waiting doesn't work, said co-author of the first guidance on this condition in 15 years from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Can waiting talk, doesn't work. Can we talk to the person who said waiting does work? I just think that both the arguments should be on the table. Um, so you've probably heard this story. I haven't. You haven't? No. Oh, so do you so you want to take a guess? What I'm, condition? I'm reasonably confident I know what the condition is, okay. and it's a killer. Yeah. It's a killer. Um, the condition, tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is that some kids in this era where, frankly, there are a lot of kids with a lot of conditions, mm -hmm. some kids don't have a condition. <laughs> and not having a condition. Wait, there's 14.4 million children in this country without a condition? That seems high, but... That's terrifying. Uh, well, right, but well, drugs imagine and surgery. how they feel. Exactly. Mm. Drugs and surgery. Because you can... I mean, you pick your condition, right? You could decide what... To condition. the operating theater with them. <laughs> exactly. So is that it? Uh, f lack of condition? Lack of lack of well, any diagnosable lack of condition. Lack of any diagnostic. Anything yeah. wrong with them? Exactly. Which would make them feel like the odd man out at school. Drugs is not too young. Or woman or... No, not drugs is not too young. Drugs is 12 is not too young. <laughs> drugs is... <laughs> and I am not on any at the moment. That was a uh, brief <laughs> moment of channeling George W. Bush. God. Is the kids learning? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 12 is not too young for drugs if no. your child does not yet have a problem. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> drugs didn't work? Try surgery. <laughs> So, How I close mean, did I get? Unfortunately, you got really far. Okay. You weren't anywhere close. But, you know, the, the language... When you allot, when you take out the name of the condition, the idea, you know, children struggling should be evaluated and treated early and aggressively, including with medications for kids as young as twelve and surgery for those as young as thirteen. Now, the the ages aren't quite the same, but this sounds like the same thing that they're doing with regard to trans, mm -hmm. right? This it sounds like that, uh, and yet in this case, um, it's not it's not trans, it's obesity, it's being overweight. It's the, it's the actual health problem of being overweight. But, but what they're recommending is drugs and surgery right? for 12 and 13-year-olds. And here's some other good quotations from, this, from the CBS story. The co-director of the Center for Pediatric Obesity Medicine at the University of Minnesota said, Obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It is not a lifestyle disease. It predominantly emerges from biological factors. <laughs> because until yesterday there were this many overweight and obese kids in the world and are still outside of the countries that feed our kids complete garbage no this this is i cannot believe that a, a doctor whose job this is is willing to go on the record saying this like have you met doctors <sighs> Sorry. Unfortunately, uh, um, a few like this. And the medical director for the AAP, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight, and a co-author of the guidelines said, this is no different, this is not different, it's, you know, she was speaking, so that it's not quite grammatically right, but this is not different than you have asthma, and now we have an inhaler for you. Which, fascinating, right? Like, why are there so many childhood allergies now? Why are so many kids asthmatic and allergic to things? It's because of what we're doing to them. It's because of what we're feeding them and because we keep our houses too completely clean of pathogens and yet we're feeding them garbage and we've got pollutants everywhere. Adjuvants. And, and adjuvants. And the obesity is the same thing. Once, you know, once you're 30, 
and obese, and you have been since you were young, it's really tough. Like, it's, it's likely that you're going to have a very, very hard time getting, getting to a weight that would have been considered healthy for your height uh, if, if you had not been obese your entire life. But children, you, you don't start with drugs and surgery for children. You don't do that. No, it's, it's insane. And it, the pattern is there for every one of these exploding pathologies, right? You've got you know, we have talked extensively about the the orthodontia version of this. We, there is obviously something that we have changed about the environment of children. Genes doesn't make any sense as an explanation. So it's mm-hmm. obviously something that we are doing. And the implication is, if it's something new that you're doing, it's something you could stop doing. Right. Right. Um, now, in the uh, in the case of obesity, how insane is it? that we're going to studiously pretend that the right thing to do is drugs and surgery for children who, frankly, maybe it's too late for them, but it's not too late for the children who haven't been exposed to whatever it is yet. And we are not, here's what we're not going to do. We are not going to go after the ability of corporations to study the psychology of children and to induce them to eat more than they would otherwise eat and eat different things than they would otherwise eat. As if that's not an obvious suspect in the the question of why childhood obesity is rising, right? Mm-hmm. We, are, we are actually allowing corporations to induce children into self-harm, right? This is as bad as allowing them to molest children, right? You are, we are harming children. They will, their whole lives will be affected by this. And we are not looking at the obvious culprits that we could obviously do something about without touching the kids, right? You could just simply say, look, yeah. I mean, I, I've made this argument not for just for food. But I don't think advertisers should have any right to advertise to children. They shouldn't have the right to study children, right? It is our obligation to protect children. We don't have any control over the ability of an advertiser to get into a kid's mind. Why are we letting them do that? Right? You wouldn't let a stranger on the street who, you know, was trying to con your kid to talk to them. So Mm -hmm. why are we allowing them to do it through screens? It makes no sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, I cannot show my screen. Is that right? Okay, that's fine. Uh, The clinical practice guideline for the evaluation and treatment of children and adolescents with obesity is an interesting document. I have that's that's the thing that came out this week that everyone's reporting on. Um, I haven't read all of it, but just just the little blurb at the top of the page reads the first sentence: 14 million U.S. children are affected by the serious and complex chronic disease of obesity. How would you define disease? Yeah, I don't think I think that actually just worked, Zach. I saw my screen jump around. Yeah, I bet it did. Um, I don't, metabolic disease, right. like in adults having had a, you know, a developmental period during which they were taking in a lot of sugar and synthetic crap and, um, no, you don't need to anymore. Um, and, uh, and, you know, becoming less active and, you know, their, their physiology changed with their diet and activity level through their childhood and adolescence and upon becoming adults. Metabolic disease may well be the right term here. And I didn't actually look up disease, what other people think disease means, but um, this strikes me as, you know, the complex, serious and complex chronic disease of obesity. That, I feel like part of what that is doing is once again encouraging people to uh, take the control away from themselves. Well, I can't do anything. I couldn't make sure I get out in the sun every day and get and synthesize my vitamin D and move my body around and make cho- learn, learn by making repeated choices about what I eat to love food that is also good for me. Well, I can't, I can't do anything. It's easier if you just give me a pill. It's much easier. And if I hear that it's a disease that I've got, then that changes the conversation. There's nothing I can do. It's a disease. As opposed to, you know what? You're a kid. And you are not. This is not your fault. But you can still take responsibility. And your parents should definitely take responsibility. And (laughs) they should keep 
you away from the doctors who were looking at these guidelines as much as possible. So at some level, it's just a charade, right? You've got an industry selling food that has a uh, perverse incentive. You've got an industry selling pills, which has got a perverse incentive. You've got an industry selling surgery that's got a perverse incentive. And there's no industry uh, of leave kids alone in a healthy environment that doesn't make them sick, right? right? They don't have lobbyists. There's nobody on that side. And so the thing that is increasingly infuriating to me is the pretense that this is about science and medicine and study and consternation about illnesses that children are suffering. It's not, right? This is somehow about business. And the problem is Mm -hmm. the people doing it don't even know that, right? I'm sure even in pharma, they go to work and they think, well, there's a biological problem called obesity in children. And by gum, we got to address it with some some molecules, right? Mm, mm -hmm. Um, And there is nobody, I mean, like, you know, there used to be medicine, right? There used to be doctors who had a scientific bent, who solved problems, who puzzled through what was making their patients sick, figured out what things might work for them. And there were things like a second opinion, right? Maybe I don't want a medical establishment in which every doctor agrees to what the CDC said. Maybe I want two doctors to disagree and I want to listen. No, but it streamlines the process because there's no need for a second opinion because you know the second, third, fourth, and nth opinion will all be the same. Therefore, you don't need them. Right. No. So it it does Mm -hmm. streamline the process. Hey, doc, these checkboxes, what do I take? Right? Mm -hmm. It's that. There is also essentially no advocacy. I can't remember the last time I heard anybody say that an ounce of prevention was worth a pound of cure. Because, you know, an ounce, yeah. an ounce of prevention is a breach of the fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, right? Prevention. How are you going to monetize prevention? Treatment. That's where the shareholders get for their their value. Pharmaceutical companies, not for doctors. Well, right? Even doctors running a practice who encourage... Uh, whatever they're called, the, like the regular healthy checkups or whatever, yep. like, you know, or an, annual exams even, but also just, oh, you know what, uh, you know, you're pre-diabetic, you're pre like this, like, it, it would be great to just have us sit down and have a face-to-face, you patient, me doctor, every six months. Like, you know, that that doesn't sound like a breach of fiduciary responsibility, whether or not the doctor is working for a hospital or their own practice or whatever. Like, if you're encouraging you know, encouraging patients to come in for office visits and actually develop a relationship with them. You know, are they going to be sicker sooner and therefore require more drugs? No, but that's a good thing. Right? Well, I agree with you. There's no doctor corporation. And I'm sure what I don't know about how HMOs and all of that work, you know, is uh, is a, a place where a lot of stuff can be hidden. Yeah. But um, But at the very least... The doctors are captured by something that has fiduciary responsibilities that we don't understand yeah. all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, this pandemic diagnosed the system, and the diagnosis was, you know, it's got a terminal illness, right? And that terminal illness will cause it to reverse the labels on cure and poison, mm-hmm. right? And once you have a medical establishment that's willing to do that, whether it's because of threats or perverse incentives or confusion, right? The point is, well, okay, that's not medicine in the sense that we used to think of it. It's something else, right? Uh, Pharma isn't in the business of making people healthier, right? It's not surprising that pharma figured out that that's not where its its bread is buttered. So, you know, what are we going to do? Because... You know, it's a great and tragic example that you've you've brought to us here where we're going to pretend that an epidemic of obesity is not about external inputs to the system having changed in a way that has overwhelmed restraint in children or overwhelmed metabolism or whatever it did. It predominantly emerges from biological factors said the co-director of the Center for Pediatric Obesity Medicine at which, the University of Minnesota, which is both 
true at a trivial level and so far misses the mark in terms of what a doctor in a position like this needs to be thinking about and must know. Must know, right? And you do find in the guidelines, you know, mention of like nutrition, healthy lifestyle. Uh, but, you know, the big thing that made the headlines and that's new here is uh, recommendations specifically identifying the youngest age at which you should start on drugs for 12-year-olds who are obese if everything else has failed. And surgery for 13-year-olds who are obese if everything else has failed. And I'm not even sure the if everything else has failed language is in there. I, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not even sure right. that's how they've framed it. Okay, but we, we got to separate these two things, right? Because it comes up in every one of these cases. Mm -hmm. They're the people who have already been affected, who may indeed have a permanent problem, a developmental right. impact on their metabolism that causes them to have a lifelong issue that we have to deal with somehow, mm -hmm. right? And then they're the people who haven't been hurt yet, an indefinitely large group. Right? All those who have yet to be born, who when they are born, will either be exposed to the factor that made these other kids fat, or they won't. Right? And so we haven't hurt them yet. The amount of good you, even if you were stuck with a bad situation for kids that have already been affected and there's nothing you can do for them that really works, the amount of good you can do by not doing it to anybody else is, is indefinitely large. And so why aren't we focused there? And why... I mean, even that statement that you read, can you describe a scenario? I'm not asking for something that is really true. Can you describe a scenario in which an obesity epidemic in children is not primarily happening with biological factors? I mean... <laughs> It's a fat suit. <laughs> it's a fat suit. It's a it's a mirror with a bow in it, right? Yeah. It's Those a, are not, it's a, it does feel like a hall of mirrors. It feels like a hall of mirrors. Maybe mm -hmm. it's all halls of mirrors. Maybe there are no obese kids and it's just a, an illusion. But short of that, you know what obesity is made of? Lipids, right? You know how lipids get into the body? Metabolism. You know how metabolism happens? You eat stuff. You know what you eat it with? You masticate it with your teeth. And all it's all Biology biological. All the way down. Right. Yeah. What else would it be? Right? They, the person has, has like put on a lab coat and said a tautology, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's wise. Well, but I mean, it also, I mean, this, I mean, we, we could. There's a whole dissertation to be had in unpacking this really ridiculous statement that seems so simple and was said with such assurance. Obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It is not a lifestyle disease. It predominantly emerges from biological factors. The first two sentences in that three-sentence statement are not true for right. children. And um, you know, once once you're stuck in it, it likely is. Um, but the third sentence, it predominantly emerges from biological factors, is a non sequitur, which is placed at the end of these other two sentences as if it is a rejoinder. No, it's not a rejoinder, it's a non sequitur. They're different. They have no relationship to one another. Obesity does stem from the crazy hypernovel lifestyle that we have pushed actively on everyone for the last N years. I don't even know what to call it, right? But, you know, you know starting sort of. I don't know, starting, but, you know, ramping up after World War II, how about? Yep. And it predominantly emerges with biological factors. Oh, that does sound science. -y. Yeah, it sounds science -y. Okay, well then, well, let's do science then. Ooh, a pill. Uh, which factors? Which factors? Uh, well, for example, uh, the big gulp. Uh, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> and other big things like the MAC. <laughs> the big MAC. Yeah. yeah. Look for, uh, alphabetically, a lot of the factors mm -hmm. are under uh, under B. <laughs> <laughs> 